with Geometry Nodes, you can build procedural effects, you can modify a mesh, you can use textures like noise and musgrave textures, just like shader nodes for making materials, but it works on the actual mesh. That makes it really powerful. Geometry Nodes works from the Modifier tab, right here. When you want to use Geometry Nodes, you simply select an object, press Add Modifier, and add a Geometry Nodes modifier. Geometry Nodes modifier starts out like this. Uh, just an empty blank modifier. It needs to have a Geometry Nodes node group assigned to it before you can start making nodes. So to do that, just push the big new button, or you can use this little drop down and pick out a node group you already have, but you probably don't have any, so just start with this one. So Geometry Nodes is like a build your own modifier. You can use nodes to make it do pretty much whatever you can think of. The reason it's in a modifier like this is so that you can do, use the same node setup on multiple objects. For example, if I were to add a second plane and put it over here, I can give it a geometry nodes modifier and I could make it have its own geometry nodes group in that modifier or I could simply use the same group from the other modifier. Now these are both using the same node setup. So I could have the same effect happening to as many meshes as I'd like. And that is great because you don't have to keep copying the same setup or make the same thing 800 times. It gives a lot of flexibility to the system. The best way to learn geometry nodes is to start really simple. Just keep things easy and play around with the nodes and it'll start, start making sense to you. The way I learned was by building a scattering system. A system to scatter objects all over another object. Like, for example, scattering a bunch of cubes all over this plane, which is what we're going to do now. It is the simplest, easiest thing you can do. Don't worry, this will be completely easy. And it won't take you very long. So, first thing to do, let's give this a name. Let's name our node group Scatter. Now click the very convenient Geometry Nodes tab. And it opens up with a bunch... It looks like a mess when you see it right away. I always like to clear this up by hitting T to get rid of that toolbar and going over here and dragging that way to lose the spreadsheet because you don't need to worry about that right now. This is the default node setup you get, the default brand new node group. It comes with a group input node and a group output node. This geometry here coming from the input is our plane, our lovely plane geometry. And going to the group output is the same thing. So geometry comes in, absolutely nothing happens, and then it goes out again. Very, very simple. Just like shader nodes, the flow of geometry nodes goes in this direction from left to right all of the time. And you'll see that there's these empty sockets here on the input and the output. And that is so that you can set input, you can set special input attributes that will give you your own settings in the modifier. So for example, I could change how many objects were scattered all over my plane. And I could just change that in the modifier for extra convenience. And on the output, it lets you output data like vertex data and UVs and a lot of complicated stuff that I still don't understand. But don't worry about those for now. We are just going to do some, the most basic thing possible, which is scatter some points. So to do that, just press Shift A and search for a distribute points on faces. And when I add that, you can see it's happening to this one and to this one over here, since they both have the same node group on them, the scatter group. The distribute points on faces node is extremely self-explanatory. It does exactly that, distributes some points randomly on the given faces. So on all the faces of the input mesh, points will be scattered randomly, and the points are now connected to the output. You'll notice we do not see the plane anymore, and that is because the points are... the only thing going to the output is the points. The plane, this geometry here, is our plane. It's no longer connected to the output, so you don't see it anymore. You're only getting the points. And if we want to see the points and the plane, we can simply add Shift A and search for a join, join geometry. That's the one. Put that there. And click and drag to connect our plane right there. So now we have our plane is being joined to the points. And that goes to the output. And that's what we see in the viewport. Points plus plane. And the points currently are being shown as these little diamond shapes. That's just the default point visualization. You can't, those can't really be rendered. Actually, they can now, but points like that is not what you want. You want, we, now we want to put objects on those points. We can change the number of points by adjusting the density here, and you can also change where they are by changing the random seed. So it's a very simple node. 
the distribute node. It gives you a lot of flexibility. You can easily change the density. And if we wanted to have a different amount of points on this plane and this plane, well, all you have to do is connect the density to the group input node. Now we have a little density field here and a little density slider over here. So I can adjust the density on this one, then click my other plane and mess up the density over there. Which is kind of neat because now I can use the same nodes with totally different settings for different objects. Now that we have points scattered all over the faces of our geometry, let's put some objects on those points. So wherever there's a point, we will instance an object. That is also extremely simple. Just do Shift A, Instances, Instance on Points. And what this node does is takes the geometry you give it, you give it a mesh and you give it some points, and it copies that mesh to every single one of those points. And for the mesh, we will just press Shift A again and get a mesh primitives cube. And we can just connect a cube to that input. And now a cube is being copied to every single one of those points. And the cube is way too big. Fortunately, it gives us a little size control here. I'm just going to put 0 0.1. Now we have a bunch of cubes there. And that's already cool. It looks like some kind of technology sci-fi thing. Also, quick tip, if it's getting hard to see in your viewport, you can't really tell where the instances are, I like to go up here and turn on cavity, which highlights the edges of things a little bit, and you can kind of see everything better. It, it really helps. Now that we have our cubes scattered everywhere, well, it, it's boring. Th there's cubes everywhere, and that's nice, but what if we don't want them all the same size or all the same rotation? What if we could add in some randomness? And of course we can. This rotation allows us to rotate all of the instances on the X or the Y or the Z. So all we have to do to make that randomized is put a random number here. And put a random number there, we'll use a random value node. Shift A, I don't know where it is. Probably, we'll just search for it. Random value. There we go. Let's change it from float to vector. A vector is just a little list of three numbers, like an X and a Y and a Z. So this since this is an X, Y, Z, a vector, vectors are purple, we can connect that to here. Now you should note, this is a good time to explain it, some of these are little diamonds, and some of them are little circles. And the difference between them is that the circle ones are just a, a single object. So like, coming out of here, this is just a single object with that is a bunch of points, and it is connected to this, which takes a single object, which is a bunch of points, or this cube, it's a single thing, it connects to here, it's a single thing. That's what it means when you have a circle. And like all of these are just one thing. I can change the number of vertices, they're just a single number values or a single vector value, a single number here. But when you have a diamond, that is actually, it's called a field. It is a list of a bunch of numbers. For example, when we're plugging in this random value into the rotation, it's it's not just one rotation, right? See how they're all rotated crazy? It's a bunch of rotations, a different rotation for every single point. That's the power of fields, where you can plug in one thing, but it's actually on the inside a bunch of different things. So all of these here are fields. For example, the scale is also a field. So remember that round ones mean you can plug in a single object, and diamond ones are actually a, are a list of a bunch of different values. Usually, it's a different value for every point of the mesh. That's almost always the case in my experience, but there is a lot I don't know about geometry nodes, so uh, surprise me. Now, some of the time you can connect diamonds to circles or circles to diamonds, but most of the time it's best to just connect them to their own kind. Sometimes, though, it, it does make sense to connect them to each other. I don't have any examples right now, and don't worry about it too much. It's just a little detail that you might want to know at some point. It might make it's not that big of a deal, don't worry about it too much. Just know that that is there, and if you ever find a problem where you can't connect a diamond to a circle, that's probably why. Now, on the random value here, we can set a minimum and a maximum. To make sure it rotates in the negative and positive direction, we'll make this negative one and leave the maximum at positive one. And that gives us each cube could be rotated to some random amount between negative one and positive one radians. And we can do the same thing for the scale. I'll just duplicate our random value node and plug it into the scale. And scale is never good to, never makes sense to go negative. It also never makes sense to leave the scale at zero. That's just confusing because something would be scaled to invisibility and you might lose it. So let's just do 0 0.1 for the minimum and 2 for the maximum. 
now we have a jumbled field of debris or something. And you can see that each cube is actually a different size. Like some of them are squashed like this, some of them are stretched into more like a beam. And that's because giving a different random value for the x, the y, and the z scale. So the x scale could be 2, or all the way to 2, and maybe the y scale is like 1, and the z scale is 0.5. So it's got a different scale in all three directions. If you don't like that, you can simply make the minimum and maximum the same. Like, maybe I only want them scaled in the z direction, so I'll make the x and y minimum 2, exactly like that. And I'll disconnect the random rotation for a minute. So now they can only be scaled in the z direction because the rest, the minimum and maximum is 2 for the x and y. So nothing's ever going to change there. And for the z, it's from 0 0.1 to 2. Or we can make that bigger. And now you have some kind of crazy city thing, which is, of course, awesome. Okay, I am going to put the randomness back because I like the mess. Okay, now we have our mess, our scattered mess. Scattering a cube is great, but what if you have your own object you want to scatter? You can totally do that. Let's do it with a monkey. We'll just add a new monkey in our scene, a new Suzanne. Put her over here, and now we want to scatter her all over this instead of the cube. So let's delete our cube. And to get an object into here, you need an object info node. And that is super easy. Just click an object in the outliner, drag it into your node group, and plug it in instead of the cube. Now we have monkeys everywhere, and they are way too big. And we can fix that with a little add a transform geometry node and that just lets it gives us some location rotation and scale so we can tweak it before we scatter it i'll put the scale to 0.1 and now we have a horribly mingled suzanne scattered everywhere that is actually rather nightmarish i'm going to make this more healthy looking if you'd like it to be scaled exactly the same in all three directions you can change your random scale from a vector to a float a float is just a single number and now you can plug that into the scale. And it's not the same type. A single number and a vector are different types, but it allows you to connect them because it will just convert this single number into, into an x, y, and z scale with all three the same. If the random value coming out of here is a 1, it'll just set the scale to 1 for the x, 1 for the y, and 1 for the z. If the random value coming out is 0.5. The x, y, and z scale will all be 0.5. So you'll get a very uniform scaling and it won't look so insane. You can even scatter collections of objects. Like if I had a Suzanne and a cylinder, I could put them in a collection together. Press M to make a new collection. Collection 2. I'll delete my Suzanne node and drag in my collection instead. And you can just plug this instance. I'll keep my transform geometry node. You can see everything is looking like it's in a crazy funny position. That's because it is. We, we need to click on separate children and reset children. Also pick instance. So yeah, when you do a collection, always remember to check mark those three boxes. That one, that one, and that one. Otherwise confusing things happen that I can't explain and it's all your fault. And the results from scattering the collection look way more interesting already. As you can see, I can just keep changing things. This is pretty much limitless. I could keep going all night, never stopping and just making this cooler and cooler. And so I'm, I'll stop here. You have a complete geometry node setup. You know how to scatter objects all over another object. You have, you know how to connect something up to the input to make fancy controls, like a density controller. You know how to scatter with a collection. You know how to scatter a single object. You just drag it out of the outliner here. You know how to randomize things. You learned about the transform node for adjusting your mesh. You learned about the distribute node to distribute points everywhere. And you learned about the instance on points node. One last thing to point out is that if I select this and I try to apply the modifier, you can apply this like any modifier. If I hit apply though, it will disappear. And that's because all of these objects on here are instances. So they're not actual part of the mesh yet. They're more like, like a linked duplicate if you've ever used that. They're just, they're this exact mesh just put everywhere on here. If this one was to change, they would all change. They're not their own pieces. That's what instances are. It saves a lot of memory to work that way so that all the vertices are only calculated once and things like that. But if you want them to be real so that you can apply the modifier and then sculpt it or something, you can simply add a realize instances node. Go in instances and pick realize instances and drop it right there. Now they're all real mesh. So if I were to apply my modifier, it's all one piece now. Tab in edit mode and you see 
It's a, you've got all the vertices here. It's a complete, complete final mesh. And it's important to make sure that if that you click this little button here, this little shield, it'll protect your node group so that if no objects are using it, it does not get deleted. If you don't have the shield on and you quit your blender and reopen it, you might lose the node group unless something is using it. So always hit that shield unless you want to lose the node group, which hopefully you don't because it's probably cool. Now, if none of that made sense to you, I suggest um, watching the video again, but maybe slow it down so you can absorb the information a little more slowly. Have a great day. Grab the demo file.